I can see you, Miss Matheny. I'm good. I can hear you too now. Are we waiting on anyone else? Sorry about that. I had some technical difficulties. No problem. If mine shows down again, you take over. So. <laughs> All right. If we're ready. Everybody's ready? Okay. So I, I got a thumbs up from Jay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start. I'd like to welcome you to our May 14, 2020 virtual meeting of the city council. We hope you and your families are staying safe and healthy. Tonight's council meeting is the third council meeting we are conducting using communications media technology as authorized by the executive order of the governor during the current pandemic. We appreciate your patience and assure you that your city council remains committed uh, to providing the public a fair and reasonable opportunity to participate in council meetings. We sincerely appreciate your continued understanding as we work through this temporary manner of conducting meetings. To tonight's meeting participants as the presiding officer, I request that each council member or designated staff member request that they be recognized by me by just simply saying, may I speak? Please do that before speaking. I will do my best to quickly recognize and call upon you. All participants should use the mute function and only unmute yourself when you seek to be recognized to speak and while you are speaking. Please remember that this meeting is being broadcast to the public and therefore we request that you eliminate any background distractions you may have at your location. <coughs> Prior to the council taking final action on any agenda item, applicants or members of the public who are present in the public access area will be recognized to address the council. Applicants and members of the public who have pre-registered to address uh, the specific agenda item through communications media technology will be recognized to address the council and email or written statements that have been timely submitted will be read into the record. The normal rules I stated earlier regarding public comment still apply. Thank you for your cooperation and efforts to ensure this council meeting is conducted in the best interest of the city of St. Cloud. With that, I call this uh, meeting to order and we will have our invocation by Pastor David Nye from Christ Our Savior Fellowship Church. And then could we please stand as he does the invocation and after which I will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life. We thank you for the blessing that you have poured out on us today. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. We intercede on behalf of all the families that have been afflicted with the COVID-19 and we pray that you would give them peace. Lord, we also pray for the members of the city council and ask that you would give them wisdom, direction, and guidance as they discuss and debate issues that come before them this evening. And we ask your blessing on our city, on our state, and on our nation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The the roll call, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Blackwell. Present. 
Jeffrey Mermathini. Here. Councilmember Cooper. Councilmember Askew. Here. Councilmember Trace. Here. The next item on the agenda are presentations, but there are no presentations at this time. The next item is our citizens forum. Any person who desires to comment on any item not on this agenda is provided this opportunity to address the city council. Each person is required to complete a signing form to be provided to the presiding officer prior to, or as soon as is practical thereafter the person addresses the council. Madam Clerk, is there anyone who has uh, requested to speak during the citizens forum? We don't have anyone present for the citizens forum. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to our consent agenda. The next portion of tonight's meeting is the consent agenda, which contains items that have been determined to be routine and non-controversial. If anyone in the audience wishes to address a particular item on the consent agenda, now is the opportunity for you to do so. Additionally, if staff or members of the city council wish to speak on a consent item, they have the same opportunity. First of all, I'll ask, is there any item that the council member, a council member wishes to speak to? Council member Matheny. Thank you. Could we pull item T as in Tom and U as an umbrella for discussion? T and U. Thank you. Are there any other items from the council? Uh, Madam Clerk, is there anyone in the audience that has requested to speak to an item? I do have some that have registered. I have um, for Lancaster Park, East That's Phase item U. 3 and 4. Correct. Is that the only item? And item A for 2020-50. And item 82R, which is item, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. that's G, 92R. Uh, there's no need for that person to speak unless you have questions on that item. Okay. Uh, Let's go to item A since uh, just take them in order. Has someone requested to speak to item A? Yes, that was Nicole Smith. Is she in the chamber? She is online. I apologize. I didn't realize I had selected to speak on that item. I, I am representing the surveyor though. Okay. So you're there to answer any questions? Yes, I will be. Okay. But and that's for Lancaster seem, Park, I think. Thank you. There doesn't seem to be any. Thank and you. I, thank you very much. And I don't think we have anyone speaking to item G, do we, or asking any questions? Then what brings us to... Item T, Deputy Mayor Matheny, would you like to address your concerns? Yeah, so, um, yes, first it's a kudos. Uh, I think they've done a great job getting all these um, historic buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, I served on the um, Historic Society as the secretary for, I don't know, about six years. So I love all this stuff. Um, I, when I had my agenda review, I asked staff about the repairs to this building. So I don't know if you recall, but this building was damaged, you know, their buildings were damaged in the hurricane. And basically they've been living inside of like plastic sheeting and 
and dealing with the with the damage because we were trying to pursue grant funding, which we did not receive. Um, which you know, it's the, it's the um, risk you take, obviously. Um, we did not receive this funding, so now we're going to try to go a different route and get you know. I did ask during my agenda review if we could prioritize and try to like expedite this because they've been waiting for two years, you know, in this um, kind of limbo. So I just want to ask the other council members if you guys agree with that. I know, um, you know, if all of us kind of chime in that we'd like to prioritize and, and push this forward as fast as we can. Would any of the other council members like to speak to that? Council Member Askew. Thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm good with that. I, um, they've been waiting for a, a long time, so if we can get them rolling, that'd be great. I think uh, Council Member Trace is in support of that also as I am. I would like to, if we haven't put a dehumidifier in there wherever any of our paper documents are, they certainly need to do that immediately until regardless of what we do, just to make sure we preserve those uh, documents from molding and uh, but I certainly am in favor too of doing whatever we can to move this forward as quickly as possible. So I I don't have all of the specifics, but I do know that they have been working tirelessly trying to get all of the documents scanned and into a database. I know that that's something they've been doing with volunteers, and um, they're doing a fantastic job. I just you know I'm I'm sure there's a, a little frustration on waiting, and then we find out oh that didn't work out, and then now we got to shift gears and go a different a different route. Um, so just anything we could do to kind of expedite that and support them would be great. Good. So Mayor Baffert, yes, uh, Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, I just want to ensure the council we hear you loud and clear. Uh, we have money budgeted. We were waiting for that grant funding, which we did not get. Um, contingent on that, we're ready to move forward. Our staff architect has a plan in place and I've directed the facilities and building official to move forward. So thank you for your support. Great. Thank you. Would you like to speak to item U? Sure. So this is the um, agenda item that I had pulled last meeting and wanted to get some of the details and they weren't able to provide those. Um, I know that Andre received an update from Lancaster. I'd like to go through it for public record purposes if Mr. Anderson could go through and address all the questions that um, were unanswered at our last meeting. Mr. Anderson, are you prepared to do that? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor. The floor is yours. Let me share my screen. You may. I hope you can see the screen, but these are the, by the way, this is Andre Anderson, the Community Development Director. The, on the screen is uh, a list of zoning requirements that we typically require um, developments that might have been developed in the county that are getting water sewer agreements. And we have applied these to other developments within the city limits. Um, and this occurred sometime after the latter part of 2018. This project, as you know, was approved prior to 20, 2018, and as such, we're not subject to these requirements. However, staff went through and reviewed all the various documents that were approved in the city to see how they might have addressed those requirements. So as far as architectural variation and sheet 20 through 21 of the final master plan, they provided several um, elevations, and if you allow me, I'll shift to that um, imagery. Which, whoops, sorry. I want to put up this image. And this image, are you able to see this? No, we don't see that yet. Okay, hold on. Let me reshare my screen. One more time. All guys, for that. There we go. Now you should see it. So, in their plan, they provided several elevations, which are all varying. Um, I think they provided a total of, I think, 22 different elevations and uh, committed to 
varying the elevations for each um, um, building as they are laid out in the project. Um, the next item on that list. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Andre, could you go back? My, my screen sent me back to my desktop, so I missed that view. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Let, let, let me pull it back up for you. One second. Here they are. So those are the different elevations that they provided. And here's another sheet of elevations. I think there's like three sheets of elevations. Are you able to see them? Yeah, sorry, I muted myself again. Um, so this is kind of what I was talking about in the last in the last meeting is it's the same building. <laughs> like, I don't really consider those like vari variations of the facade. Like if you go back to that first page, I mean, it's a, it's really just the same building over and over again, maybe a different color of paint or something, but. I, I unfortunately, I'm not able to um, articulate the details of each elevation, but um, I think the, I'm not sure if the applicant had registered or is online. I think they are. Um, and they may be able to speak to in more detail to it. I was just trying to go through the list of things that at least we found, but I would venture to say that the applicant probably needs to um, speak to the details of whether or not these elevations are different, but I'm just providing what they provided to us. Right, I understand. I just, that's kind of the thing when you drive through the other phases, it's like, I mean, maybe that Boca Raton is like super popular and it's just like over and over and over again, like the same house. Um. Yeah, there's two pages. So some are two stories, some are single story, some have porches. I mean, they have different variations as far as the title anyway. Sure. So is there anything in our approvals that, I mean, so basically they have, let's say they have 20 different facades, but it's really more like 10, you know, like with just a little tweak here and there. I mean, so if, is there any way to make sure there's a variation? Because just because they have it on the plan doesn't mean that the variation makes it into the development. So you know, uh, like everybody who comes in says, oh, I really like siesta. And so there's 47 siestas. I understand. So um, right what's in front of the council tonight obviously is to approve the final plat and to require those a requirement for variation would be something that would normally be done as part of the PUD the final master plan approval. However, the applicant uh, is always able to proffer what it is that you are hoping they will do. And so I will really leave it up to the, up the applicant to respond to that question as to whether they want to agree to limit the types of products that are offered or to establish some standard for variation that, you know, you can, you can have the same design that's on either side of the same product or you know, whatever variation you think is appropriate. Okay, before we before we talk to the applicant, can we go through the remaining yes. item? Absolutely. Oops. That not share. Okay. So the next item is the garage setbacks and their driveways are at least 25 feet in length and therefore meets the minimum requirement for at least four parking spaces per unit. Um, of course, the requirement that we have in our code today is 4.5 spaces per unit. Again, that's something that the applicant can speak to as to whether or not there's additional common areas in the project that would allow for additional um, one half space or one space per two homes. I can't verify that that can be done, but they can probably speak to that. The next item had to do with single lot tree requirements and they have 
provided that each unit has two trees per lot. Minimum gross floor area, they are providing a minimum of 1,450 square feet. Um, the air conditioner and condensing unit, they have a provision in their plan that says they'll all be staggered a minimum of 10 feet from the adjacent units. And Andre, on that item, is that something that is a part of a checklist on our um, final inspections after the house is built? Well, it's already on their plan. I mean, it, yeah, just in, in practice after it gets built, we just got to make sure that it actually gets built that way. Right. Yes, because we we have um, it would be more more likely on the construction plans that shows those requirements as part of their notes. So yes, I mean we can I can obviously get with the um, building official and put that as a checklist item that the inspectors would check for. Perfect. Um, then the next item is has to do with property maintenance. Um, property not located in the lot shall be maintained by the pri private property association. And then there's also a provision for um, street trees. Of course, it's only at the entrance of culture roads that has street trees. So those are the list of items that we would typically ask for projects to ensure that they, they include. Any questions? Um, Mayor, if it's okay, it's ask you a question. Mr. Ask you, please. So how did the, um, when was this uh, actually officially approved in, to pass over the 4.5 parking spots? Um, this project was approved in 2017. So it was just prior to when we started asking for 4.5 parking spaces. That started in 2018. It started in 2017. I remember asking for stuff like that, but I'm not sure how this one slipped through, but. Um, okay. Well, the, the P, oh, just by the way, the, 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 the final master plan was approved prior to that. The final master plan was approved, I, I wanna say it was 2016 or earlier because it was part of the the Nova Road annexations so it was proved long ago and I actually in the last presentation that it was on that list um, I, I would assume officially uh, approved by the county I would assume okay you have anything else is the uh, applicant is the applicant here? Mayor, I have um, six that have registered as the applicant. Whoever would, who would like to speak first? Sure. Uh, this is Jim McNeil, Mr. Mayor. I'm a counsel for Lennar Homes, and I have um, lead register from Lennar with us, hopefully on the line as well. Um, thank you for uh, meeting tonight on this. Uh, to try and address the two questions that came up on the, the, the parking space thing, I think as, as the staff had indicated, uh, this was approved uh, prior to those new requirements in place. Um, I, I think we've got plenty of parking in the neighborhood. We've got 25 foot setbacks. We've got a pretty good sized driveway as well. We've got probably more room there than just two spaces. So we'd ask you to keep that in mind. Uh, when you're, you know, when you're thinking about that issue, um, it's a pretty large project. So we've got a, a, you know, pretty significant areas to park as well. So I, I don't, I don't, we, we don't view the neighborhood as being, you know, tight or constrained in, in that aspect. Um, with respect to the, the architectural variation, um, we're, you know, we're complying with all the approvals and requirements uh, on that aspect. I can't speak to um, the, the, w w which homes are, are planned for phases three and four and, um, what that style is, if they're two story or one story, um, uh, lane register from Lenar will, will probably have to pipe in and, and speak to that a little bit. Generally though, that gets very difficult to try and, uh, articulate that because that's a varying, uh, it's a, it, the process varies depending on 
who the customer is, how big their family is, what their lifestyle is. Do they want a front porch? Do they not want a front porch? You know, what, what's their, what, what is their architectural preference? You know, some people like stone, some people like, you know, more of a Florida look. It just, so there's a lot of variables that go into that. And the builders typically, you know, need some flexibility um, in that regard. Uh, so I, I would leave it at that. And if, if Lane is with us, if he could uh, maybe expand on that a little bit more. Lane, would you like to speak? You need to unmute, unmute your mic. Thank you. All right, yeah, this isn't Lane. This is Mark McDonald. I'm the director of land for Lennar Homes. I uh, appreciate you guys taking the uh, opportunity to discuss this plat and review this uh, with us. So on the architectural uh, elevations of all of our homes. You know, the homeowner has the ability to pick their floor plan on their home site and uh, pick the elevation they want, they pick the color. We do restrict uh, in our HOA declarations and just our basic marketing and sales strategy that no two homes next to each other can have the same elevation or the same color. So next to each other and across the street is restricted just by our normal processes. Uh, but like uh, Jim McNeil said, you know, it, it is up to the homeowner, you know, the buyer of what they want and what they purchase. So we have some restrictions, but in certain cases, you know, some, some floor plans, some elevations are more popular than others. So they get selected more often. Uh, but, but in a free market economy, that's, that's kind of the buyer's choice is they can pick what they want because they're buying it. Uh, so we have a very, you know, broad range of plans and elevations that are available. And we let it up to the customer of what they want to pick. Uh, as it relates to the parking spaces, uh, this PUD was approved originally in 2013. Uh, there was a PDUD amendment that was done early in 2017 that was approved by the city. And the construction plans, the site development plan for phase three and four was approved as recently as October of 2019. So, you know, now we're at the final stage where this development is built. Um, it meets all approvals that we've been giving, given to date. And now we're in the final stage of planning it. Um, and the questions that are being asked are very you know, relevant questions, uh, but really those are more development approval questions that would have been handled at the PUD and the SDP stage, uh, not at platting a community that is completely constructed. So I welcome further comment. Councilor Mathieu, do you have any questions? Yeah, so um, I know there's like new people here than were on the call the last meeting, but um, you know, my concern was I drove through the adjoining neighborhood that's like the earlier phases and so there's all kinds of cars parked on the streets. So you have to weave in between the cars getting down the road, um, which is why we started that four and a half parking spaces trying to keep, you know, the cars in the driveways and in the garages and then also when I drove down the street, I was like, Good goodness, it's like the exact same house over and over and over again. Like to me, it's like, I mean, without me getting a magnifying glass, I couldn't discern the difference driving down the street, you know? So, I mean, I appreciate the fact that, you know, the buyer has a choice, but, um, you know, like when we look at the elevations there, like you've got whatever it's called, the Rio de Janeiro house, and there's four elevations, but they're like pretty much exactly the same. So. And that's my concern is like we want high end development in the city and the parking is just out of control. I don't I don't know what happens these days. It's like I guess there's more cars per house than um, 20 years ago. So, um, you know, I'd like to see if there's something we could do. I mean, are there some modifications that could be made to get more parking? I mean, to say that there's enough parking, I would disagree because I drove through the neighborhood and there's people all over the place. So. Um, is there anything that you guys could offer to help with some of the, the varying the outside of the homes? I get it. You probably have a master plan in your model that says these are the here's lot X and these are the six products that fit on lot X. And then you let the person pick. But 
I, I mean, it's pretty much cookie cutter looking development when I went through the earlier phases. Uh, well, I can respond to that. Um, as, as far as parking, you know, we can't, we can't monitor behavior. So by offering, you know, all two car garages and having, you know, a 25 foot setback to the garage, uh, having two spaces in the, in the driveway, there, there is ample parking for every home in the community. Uh, the, whether somebody chooses to park in the garage or not is a behavior that is hard for a developer or a builder to, to manage. Uh, we do have HOA restrictions. We can put, we can put more emphasis uh, on the association to manage, uh, you know, parking violations on the street. We can do overnight parking restrictions and things like that uh, through our management company and, and uh, on-site uh, community management. But as far as adding more parking in a development that has already developed, uh, that's you know, it's basically just not an option. We have uh, a site that was approved and we built it for the approved plans. So uh, we will manage it uh, through the association and try to limit, you know, how many cars are parking on the street. As far as the uh, architectural elevations and the floor plans that are offered, uh, what we are building in the community is on the approved PUD, uh, the exhibits that that Andre was was showing on the screen, uh, we can definitely, uh, you know, try to vary those up and restrict uh, more which elevations are next to each other. Uh, but again, it's the it's the buyer's choice on what they want to what they want to build on their on their home sites, and we're building you know what was previously approved. Do you have any other? Input, Councilmember Matheny. I don't. Councilmember Raskew. I guess I got to ask the question. Um, you know, in the other community over there, I, I think you you're starting to run into some safety issues with cars parked on both sides of the road and getting a fire truck down there that can amply make it down there without um, destruction of private property. Uh, that's why we start questioning. Um, Four parking spots. Nobody seems to want to park in their garage, so they tend to park on the roads, and it deems us a little bit of a safety challenge for our police and our fire. Probably not the police so much, but definitely fire. So, is there a way to address it in that way? And in, in the communities that you manage, has anyone ever made that work where an HOA is goes after the parking? And that actually works perfectly because it, I haven't seen it work here except for Camelot, which is um, a closed park um, area anyway. So if you can give me some guidance on is, is this actually work? I mean, I get it. You're going to build it. You're going to prop it. You're going to do You're moving down the line, um, but you're going to leave us with this. And I, I really don't want a mess over there. Um, so if there's some way to address some of the parking, um, I would appreciate it. So, to just to say, yeah, there's ample parking. I'm here to tell you, I've seen so many of these things built, and everyone's coming and telling us, oh, this is ample parking, 25 foot setback. The only reason we do that is because we have so many pickup trucks here. So, um, I, you know, something that with the parking would be nice. Sure, I can address that. Um, <clears throat> like I said, the HOA is, uh, is you know, the the best solution as far as uh, managing the parking on street uh, there is uh it, it can be done effectively is is everything 100 percent effective absolutely not uh but <clears throat> restricting parking on the street and making it an hoa violation is is easy to manage with itself uh, i live in a community myself that that has that requirement and if you park on the street overnight, you get a big sticker on your car. If you do it more than once, you get a fine. So the HOA can absolutely manage that. Do you have any other questions? I can ask you. You know, you know, I find this frustrating. The, you know, here we have a, a developer who has done everything according to the code and the guidelines. Uh, 
that we have required of them uh, previously, uh, including the parking. I, know, I live in a subdivision, uh, Stevens Plantation, and uh, a lot of the houses you can tell are similar, but all the facades are different. But the parking is an issue there too. It's like, you know, uh, going out and trying to buy a $300,000 home if you're a young couple, many of them end up living with their parents. And uh, you got young people that are staying at home longer and longer and longer. Most of them end up with cars. And, uh, you know, probably most garages end up for storage. But even if you put cars in the garage and then cars in the parkway, it becomes a major obstacle. It's much easier to park your car on the, in the driveway or, or on the street in front of your house than it is to have to go move your car to let somebody out who's parked in a garage. Way, uh, in a garage. And so, uh, you know, unless we uh, start changing the width of the streets and require only parking on one side, you're going to continue having this problem because families are getting larger and uh, things are issues. But, you know, I, I understand the developer's frustration, you know, when you've met all the guidelines that they're supposed to meet with their approvals previously, and now we're trying to change them. I, I'm sure that's frustrating. Councilman Trace. Uh, thank you. Um, I kind of echo your sentiment about uh, moving the goalpost on, on someone um, halfway through the game or all the way through the game. Um, not really the biggest fan of that, but um, there's some things we've been, some, some common things we've been talking about for the past uh, at least a year since I've been on council is residential building standards. Um, I know we've, we've started that process. Where are we on, on enacting um, residential building standards, architectural standards? Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, would you speak to that? Okay, well, we'll follow up with them in a bit. And then um, a, a lot of communities have gotten to the, the point where as uh, the, the neighborhood goes through the planning and design stage, you plan out where guest parking is on streets and where it's allowed on streets and everywhere else you have no parking signs on the one side or, or both sides if, it, if it's coming close to corners and painting curbs. So I, I think that's something we need to look into on a lot of these communities moving forward um, is just making sure that road widths are wide enough to fit the um, fire apparatus through there, um, you know, if there is an issue. Um, so that's something I think we should look at enacting in the future. I know we can um, mimic a lot of uh, other municipalities uh, code about that. Mr. Mayor, may I speak? Yes, you may. Mr. Anderson, may I speak now? I, I wasn't sure if um, Council Member Trace had asked me a question. I was I was um, muted at the moment. But just in response, in, in response to your um, suggestion about future design, we have been doing that. The products that have been coming in, we have been requiring them to show designated parking spaces on the roadway and where, where they have common areas, such as where they, the mailboxes might be located or the clubhouse, so that we can provide adequate visitor parking for those newer communities that are coming. So just to let you know that we are addressing that. Mr. Renzeris. And I just want to remind the council that what stage you're at here i think it's been mentioned or it's been talked around a little bit but just so you clearly understand we are at approval of the final plat and uh, basically it's presented to you because the city engineer and the city planning department and all the staff have looked at it and said the plat has submitted meets the requirements of the code and the requirements of the approval of the project so at this point the city council under the terms of the code has the option of approving the final plat as presented or requiring additional information or revisions. So I want to make sure that we, we, we stick to that and, and we deal with it. So at this point, uh, since it meets the minimum requirements of the code and meets the minimum requirements of the approved plat, I'm sorry, the approved entitlements for the project, uh, really the option of the city council right now is to decide whether they need more information or they have some revision that is plat related that they wish to offer as part of this as part of this process. Thanks, sir. 
Mayor, may I be recognized? Yes, you may, Mr. Sturgeon. I just wanted to acknowledge Councilmember Trace's question and I will get him an answer and follow up on the res uh, residential design standards. I know we're working on them. I'll get them I'll get the entire council a timeline. In, I'm sorry, Mayor, may, may I make one more comment? I yes, apologize. you may. Forgot to. So as you know, there's only four council members present. Uh, so uh, to the extent that uh, uh, this item would would uh, not pass or, or even if a motion was made and it was not approved or was a 2-2, then that essentially go forward as a denial. Uh, so I just want to point that out to you. And as we've done in the past, I want to make sure the applicants are aware of that in the event that they wish to, uh, 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 if they wish at some point they want to move this matter forward to when there would be a full council present to have a, uh, have a full vote on it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Matheny, you have any other input you want to make on this on this item? Any other input from the council on this? Have we ended our discussion now? Um, I would like to vote. I would like to vote on it separately, though. Okay. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve item U from the consent agenda. Do I have a second? I'll make that a second. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Askew. Aye. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. No. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries three to one. Madam Clerk, is there anyone else in the council chambers to discuss anything else on the consent agenda no i don't have anyone else thank you then could i have a motion that we approve the consent agenda motion to approve items a through t of the consent agenda second we have a motion from councilmember trace a second from deputy mayor Matheny for the approval of items a through t madam clerk Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Mathena. Aye. Council Member Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Give me a second. That brings us to public hearings. Madam Clerk, will you please read item number one? Final public hearing for ordinance number 2020-09. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, establishing the proposed property known as Old Hickory and further described herein and recognizing the Old Hickory Community Development District created and chartered by the Uniform General Law, the Uniform Community Development District Act of Florida, Chapter 190. Florida Statutes 2001 and hereafter, acknowledging the Uniform District Charter and expressing sections 190.006-190.041 Florida Statutes, and as referenced and provided by section 190.004, subsection 4, Florida Statutes and confirming section 189.031, subsection 3, Florida Statutes establishing the district on property proposed in this petition and designating the initial members of the district board of supervisors and designating the proposed land area within which the district may manage and finance its basic infrastructure systems, facilities, services, improvements, and projects, providing for servability and effective date. Thank you. The mayor may be recognized. Mr. Anderson, will you please speak? Thank you. This is Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This, as the clerk said, is the petition and final public hearing for the Old Cape Creek Community Development District. Uh, it meets the requirements of the four statutes for a petition and um, the applicant is in fact requesting to establish a community development district for residential development. I won't go through all the details, but generally it's for the purpose of uh, planning, finance and acquiring, construct, operate, maintain various infrastructure services within the community 
as you see on the screen. And um, as I said, it meets the criteria for establishment pursuant to chapter 194.005.1A2 of the Florida statutes. Um, they did receive written consent by all the landowners and they have an initial board established pursuant to the requirements of the Florida statutes, chapter 190.05.1A3. And this petition for establishing a community development district is consistent with our strategic plan goals for growth management and infrastructure. And staff recommends approval of ordinance 2020-09, subject to the adoption of an interlocal agreement, which was discussed at the last meeting, and for which staff had the opportunity to review. The interlocal agreement will include our does include provisions related to how they would provide these additional enhancements and amenities above and beyond the minimum core requirements, as well as to identify the different infrastructure that will be formed and maintained by the CDD, if at all. Um, City Council requested action is for adoption of Ordinance 2020-09. The applicant is present and has a presentation that they'd like to share with you. Any Thank, you. Thank you. I'll uh, entertain the applicant at this point. If you'd like to speak, please do so. Please state your name and address for the record. Mayor, Ms. Carpenter is in the council chamber. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. sorry, I have a hard time speaking with this on. Um, I decided after the technical issues at the last meeting, I thought I should come in person. So thank you very much. And we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all again. Um, we put together a presentation to sort of go through the history of the CDB, the process, and where we are, and to show the responses to the various issues that came up at the prior meetings. Um, first, I'm Jan Carpenter, representing the petitioner who's in our homes uh, in the establishment of the CDB, which is a government. We had the first reading, which was an advertised public hearing in accordance with Chapter 190 back in April 9th. And as uh, Mr. Anderson said, the statutory requirements have all been satisfied and staff has agreed. The, uh, the key issues that we are sort of dealing with and want to make sure the council understands is why is a CDD a preferable form of government over an HOA? And the question specifically are what enhancements would the CDD offer the city and the landowners in the old Hickory development? and then the requirement for an interlocal agreement. And I'll just clarify the request is a petitioner's agreement, which includes <clears throat> includes the interlocal agreement because the petitioner is the party who would sign it and provide the enhancements and the CDB would then take on, own and construct and then maintain those through the interlocal agreement after things are constructed. Next page, please. Um, after the first reading, the council members and city staff asked for the petitioner's agreement and our local agreement to assure that the enhancements are incorporated in the project. Staff and council have reviewed those agreements, given us a few comments, which we responded, and now they include the enhancements as requested by the council. Next slide, please. Um, the, and quickly, I'll go through this because I think most of you are very familiar with the CDD, but important to note that a CDD is a true government. We often hear quasi-government and other statements like that, and that's not true. It's a true government. So there's sunshine, public records laws, ethics laws, and this is a great protection for the landowners, and they don't have to wonder what's happening to the records or their money or the operations. Uh, there were many financial constraints. CDD budgets are safeguarded and the money as uh, the assessments are collected on the tax bills, which assures the city that there's gonna be funds to maintain the improvements as we talked about. I think for most of you, things like stormwater management and the important things that if an HOA runs out of funds or isn't collecting funds, those can cause public hazards. Uh, the CDD can access FEMA relief in an emergency. At hurricane time, many of CDDs have collected funds to help tree, knock down trees, clean up debris, they also have offered assistance to other local governments, such as the cities. Cities have to comply with bidding and purchasing laws, which provides cost savings, and again, provides an open environment so the residents are aware of who's doing the work to maintain improvements. Cities have annual audits that go to the state. CDDs can issue tax-exempt bonds, 
which is how the greater level of amenities for homes of similar prices can be offered as compared to neighborhoods without CDDs. An important thing is there's no burden placed on the city or other residents, only the folks in the old Hickory development will pay and be able to benefit from the CDD. And the CDD is the excellent long-term maintenance entity compared to HOAs um, from the aspect of the funds are all collected on the tax roll and the funds are a government. Um, and we have all the open and sunshine and the importance of the government maintaining CDDs and maintaining the improvements. Now on the next slide, the, one of the questions that came up are what improvements would, would the government, the CDD be offering in this neighborhood? And the enhancements beyond the land development code that are already in the approved PUD and similar to the last conversation, this PUD was a 2016 ordinance. So this has been around for quite a while. But the enhancements beyond the code are the recreational, active recreational amenities, a pool at Cabana, with restrooms, parking, playgrounds, a large open space with play fields for soccer, multi-purpose fields, passive recreational amenities, an eight foot wide pedestrian path and walking trail for residents along the east side of Hickory Grove Road. Enhanced transportation connectivity. There's access points to the school site between the internal roadway connection to Nolte Road, between the Gramercy Farms PUD and the Southern Pines subdivision on the other side. School siting. Is a 15 acre school site provided for the use of the elementary school and as noted the roadway connections will help ease traffic off the major roads enhanced open space 46.1 percent of the developable area is open space and we actually checked that just to make sure that was a correct number enhanced property buffers 10 feet of plants enhanced right-of-way buffers again six medium to small trees for 100 feet and it goes on in detail and I think we provided that to you by letter. And on the next page, the, the next question that had come up from the city council was, what will the developer do in this case beyond what was already approved? And the developer said, well, yes, we, we will offer even more at this point. Um, and, and one thing just to note, the PUD approved 750 units and the development only has construction plans for 451. So that alone is, is a big improvement and benefit to the city. The developer in this case, the petitioner, has agreed to enhancements beyond the approved PUD, and these aren't yet in construction bans. But in, uh, street trees providing along the right of way of Old Hickory, at least one tree per lot, two trees on corner lots. Adding an overlook pavilion with picnic tables and grills that'll overlook the large lake adjacent to the pool and cabana tract. A dog park fence with weight stations benches and a watering station, which seems to be the most popular thing that uh, the CDDs are, are looking at and developers are doing uh, for new neighborhoods. Additional boulevard landscaping, additional understory trees along the east and west sides of Hickory Grove Road and the north side of Surrey Springway, and then additional Nulty Road landscaping. Additional understory trees and plantings on the north and south side of Nulty Road, and that's a benefit not only for the residents, but also for all the folks in City of St. Cloud who go on Nolte Road every day. So those are substantial improvements that have been added since the um, discussion on the first reading. And then on the next page, please. Um, the petitioners and interlocal agreement. What those agreements are, are agreements. The first is the petitioner's agreement where the petitioner agrees we are going to add through a contractual agreement with the city we are going to add these additional improvements and enhancements. Um, there are certain enhancements that will be maintained by the CDD. We're asked specifically about the sidewalks and stormwater tracks. Um, the petitioner's agreement requires the petitioner, the home builder, to provide additional information to the residents to make sure anyone who purchases in the community understands the CDD structure and how it's different from an HOA and what the various responsibilities and, and obligations are. Um, the interlocal agreement, which would be signed once the CDD has its first meeting and starts, will provide extra public notice again to provide additional information and makes, make sure that educated home buyers are, are in the district. And then the, the, in, the CDD will also provide enhanced notice requirements, uh, putting extra notice in the public records, providing notice to homeowners of the annual meeting schedules, things that aren't required by statute. Some, some things that are required by statute, but just making sure that the homeowners understand the 
benefits of the CDD and how they're paying for the, their improvements. And on the next slide is just a, a schematic of the pool and the uh, cabana area you'll see past the pool, also showing the playground and the open space. The pool has the, the various um, restrooms and amenities there. You can see some of the trees. On the next slide, a schematic of an entry sign showing some of the enhanced landscaping. And again, that's, that's what it's intended to look like to show the benefit of this type of community and what a CDD can offer in the community uh, over the HOA structure. And then finally on the last page, the CDD has offered enhancements you know, well beyond the PUD and in, in response to the requests of the council, the street trees, the lake overlook, the dog park, enhanced landscaping and enhanced multi road, road right of way landscaping. And so with that, we'd request approval of the ordinance and establishing the CDD. And I'm here to answer questions. We also have some uh, representatives from Lennar if there's additional questions about the development. Mr. Mayor, your mic is muted. You're muted, Mayor. Thank you. Does anyone else in the chamber besides the applicant that would like to speak uh, to this issue? There's no one in the chamber, but we do have several that have registered. Okay. We have... Uh, Sorry, we have Nicole Smith, Patrick Bowman, Lane Register, Mark McDonald. Is Nicole Smith available online? No, she is she not earlier. Mr. Register is the only one current. Uh, Mr. Register is the only one currently online. Okay. Mr. Mayor, this is Lane Register. We're here to answer any questions that the council has. Thank you. All right. Does the council have any questions you'd like to ask? Council Member Matheny. I do. Thank you. Um, I uh, One of your bullet points that you had on there is you said no burden placed on city residents. That was one of your bullet points. Can you specify what burden you've removed from the city residents by having a CDD? Um, the, the fact that there's gonna be increased landscaping um, along the boulevard, along the public roads that will be maintained by the CDD. So it'll be a benefit to the city and the city residents at no cost to anyone outside the development. Okay. I don't know that I don't know that I would classify that as no burden placed on city residents, but um, in the bullet points that you had that you said you're going to take care of the sidewalk and the stormwater, but you're not offering to take care of the roads. That's yes, that, that's correct. Um, the roads have been uh, in the plat. It talked about those being dedicated to the city and that was accepted by the city and that has been in the past approvals. The reason why CDDs generally don't take care of roads is that um, the gas taxes that folks pay when they buy gasoline, the state collects and those go to the counties and cities. CDDs do not collect any of that. And the few CDDs where we do represent um, CDDs that do own roads, residents get kind of upset because they say, hey, we're paying taxes to the city, we pay taxes for our gas tax, but then we still are taking care of our own roads. So that has not been put into this particular development and generally is not included. So, um, you know, uh, to the other council members, you know, when you drive around this city and, and surrounding areas and you pass by these really nice neighborhoods um, that have the big berm, the big landscaped berm, when you're driving down, you know, like Narcusi Road, you pass by Turtle Creek and you've got this big landscaped berm with, you know, where you're not seeing all the houses in there. And then the neighborhood, uh, I'm always bad as a Twin, Oak, Twin Oaks, Twin Lakes, whatever that neighborhood is, the 55 and up community, 
when you pass by that, they've got this big berm and landscaping. And I really feel like that would help if we started requiring that berm to like, you know, change the view sheds that you're not seeing the back of all these houses. And, and especially like, even when they vary the front of the house, the back of the house all looks exactly the same. It's like exactly the same shape with a, like a cutout for the porch. I think for me, I feel like that would, um, you know, increase the aesthetics in the community. Um, I know they're saying they're enhancing the landscaping along Nolte, but I would like it to have a, I would like to see a berm, a berm with the plantings on it, similar to what we have at Turtle Creek. And we did another development off of Narcusi Road with that as well. Was it Center Lake that we required that? Um, and so that's something I'd like to do is, I know they're saying they have enhanced plantings, but I, I'd really like to see a berm like obstructing the view into the community from, from Nolte Road and the internal roads too. I don't have the layouts all in my, I don't know what the layout all is in the community, but this development to me is kind of weird because I feel like at the 11th hour, like you're saying you, these approvals have already happened, but we didn't know you were trying to do a CDD until the 11th hour, like we've done all these approvals and then it's like, now we want to do a CDD. I mean, maybe staff knew, but I didn't know. So, um, you know, I think that's an issue as well. Like we've kind of done all the approvals and then now you come in and say, you want to do a CDD. But um, would you guys be willing to do like berms with the landscaping on it to like help provide screening into the community? Uh, yep, Deputy Mayor Mulaney, this is Lane Register. So, uh, oh, uh, hey, this is Lane Register with Lenore. Um, so, yeah, I'll speak to that. Uh, so, right now at, at the stage we're at, so this this community is um, essentially at, sta at substantial completion. Uh, so, out on Nolte Road, we have a, a 10 foot buffer. Uh, putting a berm in that buffer it would essentially be. Uh, impractical at this point we are planning to install a fence along the entire length of nolte road on both sides of nolte road for our phase one and future phase four i mean if a wall would be better a fence isn't very you know a fence looks bad in a couple years okay well uh yeah i uh, i hear you we can we can absolutely do a masonry wall So you're you're agreeing to a masonry wall, is that correct? That is correct. Would any of the other council members have any questions or comments at this point? Councilmember Askew. No, I don't have anything to add. A bit outside the, the realm of the CDD approval. Okay. Mr. Manzaris. I was just going to point out if that's something that the that the council wants to move forward with it, there is the agreement, the petitioner's agreement that ultimately goes into a local agreement that has an enhancements in it. So that could be added to that enhancement. That agreement has an additional enhancement. And, and I do believe those improvements would be um, able to be funded with CDD proceeds as well. So that could be something paid for by the CDD as a benefit. Yes, that's correct. Any other council members to ask you? Do you have questions? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Is, do we have a particular height we're looking for in this particular masonry fence? We want to get that, you know, are limited to six at feet. Least, at we, least six feet, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we, we would typically construct it at six feet. Thank you, sir. Do we have any other questions or concerns from council? Could I entertain a motion? Uh, motion to approve ordinance 2020-09 um, with the future inclusion of a masonry wall along both sides of Nolte, uh, where the lots back up to Nolte Road. I have a motion from second. Councilor Trace. Do I have a second? Second, Councilor Rasky. Madam Clerk. Deputy Aye. Councilor Aye. Councilor Trace. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trey. And then Mr. Thank and Ms. Carpenter, thank you. Brings us to item number two. Madam Clerk, will you please read that? First public hearing for ordinance number 2020-15. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, amending Chapter 44 Utilities, Article 2, Sanitary Sewer System, Sections 44-113, sanitary, sanitary Sewer Account, Name, amending Article 4, Portable Water, Section 44-332, Portable Water Facility Account, Name, amending Article 7, Stormwater, Sections 44-536, Billing and Payments and Penalties, amending Chapter 22, Emergencies, Article 2, Division 2, Section 22-35, Schedule of Usage Fees, and Chapter 36, Solid Waste, Article 2, Section 36-36, Initiation of solid waste collection fees, clarifying certain procedural requirements for establishing the administering potable water, sanitary sewer stormwater EMS, and solid waste utility account as set by resolution, providing for severability conflicts, codification, and effective date. Can I have some of the staff to speak? Sure. This is Marjorie Craig, the Environmental Utilities Director. Thank you. So currently the city has uh, stormwater EMS and storm and solid waste residential accounts that are not associated with a water meter and are and they're only billed for those three services. And those utility accounts are usually master metered with a, a, a master water meter. So that's typically a duplex apartment complex or multi unit uh, buildings. So this method um, does not allow us uh, or the city to enforce the requirement. Uh, and so what we're proposing is to uh, uh, combine the EMS solid waste and stormwater billing to the water bill, the, the master meter, and, and which will be billed to the owner as opposed to the individual uh, people living in the individual units, much like we are in our, our individual houses. So it'll be in the name of the owner. So it'll be much more efficient and uh, reduce the de delinquency of the accounts. Good. Do you have anything else? It was a staff recommends approval. Ms. Craig, it's good to have you here. Good to have you on our staff. Thanks for being at our first council meeting and speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone in the audience or has uh, requested to speak to this item, Madam Clerk? I do not have anyone in the chambers and I don't have anyone registered. Thank you. Do we have any discussion or motion by council? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion from Deputy Mayor Matheny. We have a second from Council Member Trace. Where was that correct? Correct. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll for the approval of item number 2020-15. Councilmember Askew? Aye. Councilmember Trace? Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 4 zero. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please read item number three? First public hearing and introduction for ordinance number 2020-19. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, providing for local vendor preference for Osceola County individuals, firms, or companies with regard to procurement of products, materials, and services by the City of St. Cloud, providing that qualified local vendors shall enter shall certain in certain instances shall, shall be provided a local vendor preference with regard to the net bid price for the local vendor is otherwise otherwise fully qualified to meet the city requirements providing that all other provisions of the city procurement policy and applicable laws shall remain in effect and apply to the governed purchases by the city providing for servability conflicts and effective date and automatic repeal the mayor Torres will be speaking on this if you'll allow her okay please please do so Hi, good evening. Leslie Flores, Procurement Services Director. 
Ordinance number 2020-19 would be for the establishment of a local preference. The City of St. Cloud previous ordinance 2015-20 established a local preference that was automatically repealed in March of 2017. And currently there is a need to promote business enterprises that own property, operate businesses and offices and employ individuals and pay taxes within Osceola County. Ordinance 2020-19 would establish a local preference for all goods and services, except as may be exempted by applicable state and federal law. Uh, the local preference applies to Osceola County persons, firms, and our corporations, which meet one or more of the established criteria. Um, they would have to have their headquarters, manufacturing facility, or locally owned franchise located in or having a street address within the legal boundaries of Osceola County for at least a year. Um, post office boxes do not qualify as a verifiable business address. Um, if they employ 30% or more full-time employees whose primary residence is located within the legal boundaries of Osceola County, um, if they employ less than full, five full-time employees and utilize subcontractors to provide products or services, then 60% of those subs must be qualified local subcontractors. And the owner or principal of the business would have to maintain his or her primary residence within the legal boundaries of Oxford. Uh, the local preference results in the qualified local vendor being awarded a contract at the amount of the lowest submitted, submitted bid if the local vendor's bid is the next lowest bid and the bid amount is within the applicable percentage. Uh, the recommendation I would like to make tonight, if you look at the preference section of the ordinance that is presented, um, there is a breakdown of percentages based on bid prices um, and that was in in place previously through 2017, I would like to recommend that we make it a straight 5% so that we are consistent with Osceola County and the city of Sim. Uh, do you have any questions? Staff recommendation would be the approval of ordinance 2020-19. Thank you. Madam Clerk, is there anyone registered to speak to this item? I do not have anyone registered and no one in the audience. Thank you very much. We will have discussion and motion by council. Councilmember Matheny. Um, <laughs> I, I thank you uh, to procurement for this agenda. Um, actually, this whole agenda that we have, you guys have like really been super busy and rocking it right now. Um, I, I agree with her recommendation to be consistent with the other communities. I did want to point out to everyone um, that you know we can't do the local vendor preference on a lot of projects because if it has state or federal or grant funding you can't you can't do the local vendor preference but um, you know I, I agree with the recommendation to go with the five percent and I'll make a motion if no one else has uh, any comments do we have any other comments from council councilmember trace I'll um, second that and I agree this is a uh, good um, policy uh, to have and just want to point out that it won't cost us any more they could just match that bid so it doesn't it doesn't actually cost the city more if they're the, the next highest bid they can match uh, down to that um, that lowest bid so um, I'll second uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Thingy's motion. Mr. Mayor before you Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Manzer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to point out, and this is, and just for a point of information more than anything, in case as you're out in the community, you hear about this down the road. Some of the unique things that's been going on with these preferential, these preference, local preference ordinances that other communities will start adopting an ordinance that basically says, if you come from a community that has a local preference, then when you bid on our projects, uh, as a member of another community, they essentially will, for lack of a better word, penalize the bidder in the local bid process. So we have to manage that and watch that uh, carefully, which is why this is not going to be codified. Part of the reason why this wouldn't be codified in the code, so that it would be in place on the idea that it could be removed if it deemed that it wasn't appropriate or wasn't needed. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion from council? If not, we have a motion from Deputy Mayor Matheny for the adoption of uh, this item. 
five percent amendment. We have a second from Council Member Trace. Madam Clerk. Council Member Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Council Member Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Big guy. Motion carries four to zero. Thank you. It brings us to item number four. Madam Clerk. Public hearing for resolution number 2020-087R, a resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, amending resolution number 2019-169R, which adopted the fiscal year 2019-2020 budget for the City of St. Cloud, finding the City Manager has cer certified their prior year fund balances and or current revenues available in the budget for additional projects and programs in the various funds not included in the original budget, requiring the budget to be increased to include additional funds in the in the various funding in the various funds and making supplemental appropriations within the funds. Thank you very much, Mr. Ms. Colazzo. Are you speaking to this item? Yes, sir. Good evening, uh, Wendy Colazzo, Finance Director. Budget Amendment Four under Resolution Number Twenty Twenty Zero Eighty Seven R. First item. Um, from the OUC St. Cloud Business Development Fund, we will be increasing by $50,000 in order for the Economic Recovery and Stimulus Plan Grant Program for the nonprofit businesses as it relates to COVID-19. Secondary item also coming from the OUC St. Cloud Business Development Fund for $200,000 will be for the Economic Recovery and Stimulus Plan uh, for the Grant Assistance Program for Small Businesses, again, as it relates to COVID-19. Third item for the third phase would be from the OUC St. Cloud Business Development Fund yet again from prior year fund balance and increase to expenditures at $250,000 for the post-recovery efforts for as it relates to COVID-19. That is a total increase of $500,000 from the Business Development Fund. Third item will be coming from the sewer fund. We are increasing expenditures um, and decreasing contingency by 105,159. This is for the rehab of the sanitary uh, sewer laterals through the installation of uh, a pipe liner and lateral seals. And this will be under project WW2008. Final item for budget number four will be an increase to the revenue uh, and also the expenditures in recognition of $24,414 which is grant funding provided by the CARES Act through the U.S. Department of Health, also known as HRSA, in order for the recovery of the cost for additional PPE necessary to respond for the uh, confirmed COVID-19 patients. This is being tracked under Project PS2008. This is budget number number four. After this budget amendment, it is the intention of the city to return back to the cyclical quarterly budget amendments, unless there is something mission critical that happens during this time. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And this is your budget amendment number four for your approval. Staff recommends that. Approval. Thank you very much. Is there anyone registered to speak to this item? Madam Clerk. We have no one registered and no one in the audience. Thank you very much. We'll have discussion and or motion by council. Any questions? Council member Askew, are you wanting to speak? Uh, no, motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion for a motion for Council Member Askew, a second from Deputy Mayor Matheny. Madam Clerk, you call the roll. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Council Member Askew. Aye. Council Member Trace. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries four to zero. Brings us to council action. Item number one, Madam Clark. Resolution number 2020-082R, a resolution of the city of St. Cloud, Florida, establishing, establishing the economic recovery and stimulus plan to provide financial and technical assistance to local businesses affected by COVID-19, making certain funds providing for conflicts and providing an effective date. 
Mr. Anderson. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm trying to get the slide. There we go. Um, uh, Andre yeah. Anderson, Community Development Director. This is the first resolution 2020-082-R for the express purpose of approving the overall economic recovery stimulus plan. Um, this would be approving a, an overall plan in the amount of $1.25 million. Um, this plan that, that was presented to you before is will be rolled out in three phases. Phase one would, would be in the first 30 days, phase two, 30 to 90 days, and phase three, which we would hope would be post COVID-19 um, recovery efforts. As I said, it's for $1.25 million, and we've been looking at multiple funding sources, one of which would be the OUC Business Retention Fund in the amount of 500000 And then the um, second portion of that funding would come from uh, the Building Fund, and I'll talk about it in a second. So phase one would be $250,000 from the OUC fund, or 50% of the allocation, for two specific grant programs, and that's part of phase one. One part of it, 200,000 would be for the small business grant program, and the second part would be for the nonprofit grant assistance in $50,000. Phase two would be up to $750,000 from the building fund, and the discussion that was had at, at our last meeting was to look at what types of um, fee waivers could be done to encourage development, and we got a lot of input from the council, and we are putting together a more detailed uh, response to bring back to you for phase two, which would look at everything from what types of fees to waive to encourage development in the downtown. Uh, Deputy Mayor Missy had mentioned that a few times, and so we are definitely going to bring back a program that addresses all the concerns that were raised. Phase three of the program is what we considered post-COVID activities. And we, at this point, we don't know how much assistance we, we can provide in phase one. So we don't want to use all of the funds up front and find out that there are other businesses or areas that we neglected. And so we're wanting to do sort of a wait and see, go through the first phase, see how it assists local businesses, and then follow up with the phase three after we've seen um, the, the benefits that are realized from phase one. Um, so this overall plan is consistent with our economic development um, goals as well as growth management and staff recommends approval of resolution 2020-082-R to establish the COVID-19 economic recovery and stimulus plan. Happy to answer any questions. Would you like to go ahead and speak to the next two items? Sure, that... I, I can. Well, there's, yeah, I, I will. Let me, I lost my screen there for a second. I apologize. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Manzaris. Yeah. Mayor, I don't, I'm not sure the clerk read those items in, if we could do that before we... No, they didn't. Okay. Thank you. Well, why don't we just go ahead and deal with the item number one then? All right. Do we have any anyone in the uh, uh, chamber or registered to speak to items, item number one? No, we don't have anyone in the chambers or registered. Do we have any discussion or motion by council? Councilman Rescue. I give a motion to approve. I'll make a second. Madam Clerk, you call the roll. Can I have a comment first? Yes, you may. Um, I, I, I'm fine with the, the, the phase one and the phase three. I, just, I still have some trepidation on the phase two. Um, so just, I, I really want to uh, talk through that a lot more. Um, before we just start, start waiving fees for things that um, might not be uh, effective and efficient. Well, I'm sure that's coming back. Any other discussion? Madam Clerk, you call the roll. 
Councilman Raskew. Aye. Councilmember Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries four to zero. Madam Clerk, will you read item number two? Resolution number 2020-083R. Resolution of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, establishing two grant assistance programs titled COVID-19 Nonprofit Grant Assistance and COVID-19 Small Business Grant Program, which are considered phase one of the St. Cloud COVID-19 Re Economic Recovery and Stimulus Plan, making certain fun fundings, providing for conflicts, and providing an effective date. The mayor may speak. Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This is um, resolution 2020-083-R for establishing and implementing phase one of the economic recovery and, and stimulus plan that you just approved. And it's for two specific grant programs. One is the nonprofit assistance grant, which I mentioned a minute ago, which is basically to help offset operational costs for nonprofits. It's allocated for $50,000 from the OEC fund and each nonprofit is eligible, or each eligible nonprofit agency would get up to $5,000 um, in funding. Then COVID-19 Small Business Grant Program, again, also to help offset operational costs for business continuity and maybe also used for working capital. It is being funded for uh, up to $200,000 and each eligible business will receive up to $10,000. It is consistent with our economic development strategic plan goal and goal management strategic plan goal and staff recommends approval of resolution 2020-083-R to create the two specific business assistance grant programs as part of phase one of the economic recovery and stimulus plan. I have to the questions. Thank you. Is there anyone in the chamber or register to speak to this item? I do not have one, anyone in the chambers or registered. Thank you very much. We have discussed the motion by council. Motion, motion to approve resolution 2020-083-R. We have a second. motion from council member Trace, a second from council member Askew, Madam Clerk. Council member Trace. Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny. Aye. Council member Askew. Aye. Mayor Blackwell. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Madam Clerk, you read item number three. Resolution number 2020 120 R. A resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, approving the use of 500000 from the St. Cloud Orlando Utilities Commission Business Development and Customer Retention Fund, created by the Interlocal Agreement of April 25, 1997, for the city's use to fund the city's COVID-19 economic recovery and stimulus plan and providing an effective date. Mayor, may I speak? Yes, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Andre Anderson, Community Development Director. This is resolution 2021-20R. It is specifically to authorize the city council to use up to $500,000 from the St. Cloud OUC Business Retention Fund. We have notified OUC of our intent to use the funds and they have no objections. Um, this would fund phase one and phase three of the stimulus plan. Phase one, of course, is for $250,000, and phase three is for $250,000 as well. Um, it's consistent with our strategic plan goal for economic development and growth management, and staff recommends approval of resolution 2021-20R to use up to $500,000 from the OUC retention fund. Have the answer to questions. Thank you. Once again, is there anyone that has registered to speak to this item, Madam Clerk? No, we have no one registered and no one in the chamber. Thank you. We'll have a discussion on motion by council. Councilmember Triggs. Um, I just want to point out our um, kind of applaud staff for, for coming up with this idea. I think it's a uh, excellent use of the funds um, out of that OUC fund uh, for this business stabilization. So I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2020-120R. Council member, ask you, would you like to speak to this? Uh, 
I'll second it. And I also like to commend um, staff for coming up with this. And this is just, I think it's going to be a true help to a lot of the business. Stuff, right? so I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion from Councilmember Trace and a second from Councilmember Askew. And uh, I think we all have the same sentiment. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Aye. Councilmember Askew? Aye. Councilmember Trace? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you, Mayor. Madam Clerk, do what? Madam, Madam Clerk, will you call, we read item number four. Resolution number 2020 132R, a resolution of the City Council of the City of St. Cloud, Florida, creating a special award leave program for employees related to the novel coronavirus disease. COVID-19 and the current state of emergency and providing an effective date. Mayor, I thank you. Recognized. Yes, you may, Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, council, if you recall last council meeting, we had a, a discussion about uh, my intention to provide our employees with a special pay. And we went back and looked at that legally. I'm gonna ask Mr. Menzeris to review that. And we're unable to do that because we didn't have a policy in place for this type of emergency. Um, some people have compared us to the city of Kissimmee. Um, their chief executive, their city manager, has different executive powers that I have. So I had to bring this in front of the council to be approved. Um, but because of legal ramifications, I won't be able to do the pay. So we've come up with a special award leave program. And I'll ask Mr. Menzeris to jump in if I could, Mayor. Mr. Menzeris. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Sturgeon. So, Mr. as Mr. Sturgeon pointed out, he did come to us and ask us to review this this uh, this item from that perspective. Unfortunately, the statute, the, the legislature several years ago uh, put in place a statute that prohibits the payment of extra compensation to a city employee after they have provided the services. So essentially that provided that, that meant that the city could not go back in time and, and add a supplemental compensation package for employees who had already provided the services to the city. So this was the alternative that, we came, that we've come up with uh, to basically allow them award leave, which does not require a direct payment or payroll dollars to the employee and therefore doesn't qualify as compensation, but does allow them to have some extra time off due to the fact that they had to, uh, uh, have, they were required to work on city facilities uh, during the state of emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sturgeon. Do you have anything else? Yes, Mayor. Thank you. I just want to also um, assure the council that that we're looking at this. We will come back and develop a policy. Hopefully, we won't ever have another pandemic, but that kind of encompasses any type of unforeseen emergency. And I'll present that to the council requesting. Um, me be allowed to establish that emergency pay. I, I already do it through the hurricanes, but it wasn't addressed for specific types of incidents. So I'd like to come back with something that in the near future. Thank you. I think that'd be appreciated. Madam Clerk, is anyone registered to speak to this item? I do not have anyone registered or anyone in the audience. Thank you very much. Do I have discussion and a motion by council? Councilmember Matheny. Thank you. Um, thank you um, to the city manager for the quick pivot on this uh, idea. And, you know, I know that we had talked about doing the previous program. So I appreciate you, you trying to find a way to get what we were trying to do accomplished. So I appreciate that. Um, if no one else has any comments, I would make a motion to approve. And then I'll make a second. Is there any other comment? We certainly appreciate all that the staff has done. Appreciate, uh, again, Mr. Sturgeon's creativity here. Madam Clerk, you call the roll. Councilmember Askew? Aye. Councilmember Trace? Aye. Deputy Mayor Matheny? Aye. Mayor Blackwell? Aye. 
Motion carries 4-0. Brings us to our attorney, Mr. Menzeris. Do you have anything for us? I do not, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Menzeris. Mr. Sturgeon. Yes, Mayor, one quick item. Um, I went back and looked at the agenda prep a worksheet and we were scheduled this month to have a workshop on commercial and residential architectural design standards um, that uh, has been pushed to next month on the 18th so we'll see how the COVID-19 thing works out hopefully we can have a workshop on that and uh, we'll be ready to go I just want to tell the council that Mr. Trace had asked that question so thank you mayor that's all I have thank you council member Trace Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to bring up a, a question um, uh, for all of us to, to think about and talk about and hopefully um, enact. Um, a while ago, we had moved the fire inspection, um, the, the part of that that is under the building department. We moved uh, those um, staff and those fees under the building department. I wondered if uh, everyone's feeling about going back the past three or four years and reallocating those funds and uh, and back charging the, the building department um, that the, the point of this is right now we're, we're kind of up at our limit of how much building funds we can we can hold in the building department um, uh, based on statute that changed last year or the year before so I was just wondering if we could um, if uh, it was the council's um, uh, you know, thought to update that part of uh, policy to to move those funds um, to help with that allocation. Thank you. Um, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Mr. Trace. I know that um, when I came on to council, our finance people weren't as easy to understand as Ms. Colazzo is now <laughs> and you would ask questions and I would always be like what at the end of it I never really understood but to kind of like tag into your comment one of a previous finance director had told me that we just in the last couple of years had broken out the building fund in, in its own fund and he had said I don't know why we did that I mean so if that's something we could go back and look into um, and see if there was ways to reallocate funds I'm all for that Well, I certainly don't have any opposition to that, certainly being looked into and see if that's a possibility. So, Ms. Colazzo, could you check into that and get with Mr. Uh, Sturgeon and the uh, city attorney and review the line? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. As you directed, I'll look over. Um, and think. Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, and Mr. Mayor, can you Sturgeon, hear me? I didn't leave you out on that. <laughs> yes, I can. I'm now. So sorry. Uh, yes. Sorry about that. Yes, we Mr. Sturgeon, will, will definitely do what's been said. Well, thank you. I should have gone through Mr. Sturgeon. I got a little ahead of myself. Mr. Sturgeon, you'll take care of that, I assume. Absolutely, Mayor Council. We'll, we'll look into that and report back. Um, thank you very much. Council Member Matheny. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Trace, are you through? Uh, uh, one thing, I just wanted to thank a lot of the local businesses. Um, some of them have uh, opened up their doors to allow uh, residents, you know, the, a lot of those businesses are still able to get meat in bulk and um, vegetables in bulk, and they're, um, they're buying them on behalf of some of the citizens and, and reselling them to them um, at middle or no profit um, to help you know, get some of that out there uh, to some of the residents. I just want to thank some of those businesses that have done that. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Matheny. Thank you. I, I don't really have anything um, to update. I know y'all are shocked. <laughs> I would I would just like to say to the um, St. Cloud Police Department that I really appreciate their professionalism um, during this really, you know, tough time in our city's history. I know we had a horrible, horrible incident happen. And I know that, you know, emotions flared and, and you know, there's there's just been a lot of um, 
angst in the city and and you know the city um the saint cloud police department has just maintained a level of professionalism you know while being attacked that i you know, i really applaud them for that and thank them for all of their hard work and getting and getting to the bottom of uh of what's happened in this incident and also i know there's a lot of hard work yet left to do and so i just i just want to give them kudos all of the first responders you know even the the ems that had to re respond to that event that just had to be horrific um and i just really appreciate all they do for us thank you councilmember ask you i would say the same for mr trace and uh, uh deputy mayor Matheny. all of the things that staff has done and police and ems and the fire department and staff that uh, picks up our trash everything it's uh there's there hasn't seemed to be a hiccup in there so i appreciate uh, bill's leadership and pete's leadership and go and um thank you so much and, uh, i'd like to say ditto to all of that the staff has just been amazing uh, i'm very grateful to mr sturgeon for his uh, incredible excellent leadership uh, thank you for the way you really served our community. It's been excellent. I would like to just uh, bring up an item uh, for you, Mr. Sturgeon, uh, to check into. Usually after, uh, if, if anything happens like it happened in 2008, and with all of the uncertainty in our economy, uh, usually a lot of things begin to crank up on the federal level for infrastructure projects. And I just want us to be prepared that if that is something that does become available uh, as far as funding uh, to put people to work who may be out of work, uh, just, uh, and you're probably already ahead of me, I hope, I would imagine that if any of these dollars do become available in grants, et cetera, uh, that whatever infrastructure projects that we could hopefully have a shovel ready to go would would get us ahead of the game of being able to qualify for any kind of funding uh, that might become available if you could uh, start uh, you know, making sure we have that list updated of things that we might be able to take advantage of if uh, that funding does become available yes sir, mayor, we're working close i'm sorry go I'm ahead finished. go right ahead Thank you, Mayor. Um, first off, yes, we're working with our both our state and our federal lobbyists to pick up on those things. They're really good at giving us a, a heads up. Um, they have a great procurement team and a contract grants writer that's been phenomenal. So when that stuff starts coming down the pipeline, we'll be ready to go. Yeah, that was my next point to make sure we uh, communicate with our lobbyists to identify any uh, available funds that might be things that our you could take advantage of and uh, so you're already ahead of the game there thank you I uh, just want to remind anybody that might be listening uh, that the census is very very important and if you haven't uh, participated and uh, filled out your portion of the census uh, please go online and do so it's very important to our city as well as to our county and uh, just encourage you to please be a part of that census and please be counted and fill that out. With that, we come to our information section and report section. Thursday, May the 14th, uh, Osceola County's Transportation and Transit Department meeting will take place at 6 p.m. Tuesday, May the 19th, Osceola County's Transportation and Transit Department meeting will take place at 6 p.m. again. Thursday, May the 28th, we will have a city council meeting. We have issued three proclamations, a proclamation in recognition of Building Safety Month, a proclamation in recognition of Emergency Medical Service Week, a proclamation in recognition of National Public Works Week. I'd like to remind all of our council that the warrants list number 10 and 11 are available for your review. With that, there's nothing else on our agenda. We will consider ourselves adjourned. Thank all of you for participating and uh, thank you for your patience this afternoon.
we're done. Thank you, Mayor.